Okay. Well, greetings, everyone. I am State Representative Karen Camper. I serve as the president of the National Organization of Black Elected Legislative Women, or Nobel Women. And for those who are new to our organization, Nobel is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, primarily composed of current and former Black women legislators, as well as many appointed elected officials. Our mission is to increase and promote the presence of Black women in government. Our objectives are to create programs and platforms that advance Black women in the field of public policy, public service, and civic engagement. To act as a network and support system for Black women in public policy and organizational leadership to serve as a venue for thoughtful dialogue on issues of public interest, which elected officials and stakeholders are which are of interest to elected officials and stakeholders and to train and educate uh, uh, and cultivate a class of experienced Black women to assume governmental and corporate leadership roles. On behalf of our National Board of Directors and our partner, Merck, I want to welcome you to the event entitled Black Maternal Health Karen gave me a shout out and Wellness. I didn't know it. Represent Senator Agberry, you need to mute. Today, we are, you need to mute. Today, we are joined by our colleagues from Mercs for Mothers to discuss the state of Black maternal health in the US and to learn more about strategies to promote maternal health equity for all. Thank you for your continued support and we are looking forward to this conversation. And with that, I will introduce our uh, presenters for today. Jacqueline or Jackie, uh, Caglia it has uh, 19 years of experience in public health and development sectors. As the Director of Global Communications and U.S. Programs, Jackie is responsible for strategic communications across Merck for mothers and for managing stakeholders and grantees working to help in preventable maternal deaths in the United States, including the safer Children Childbirth Cities Initiative. Prior to Merck for Mothers, Jackie was the Associate Director for the Women of and Health Initiative at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where she directed the knowledge management and communications activities of the Maternal Health Task Force, co-authored the Lancet Commission for Women and Health Report, oversaw administration and operations and taught a course on gender and health. Before Harvard, Jackie was program director at World Connect, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and well-being of women and children through community-led solutions. Prior to this, she worked with, with the Institute for Community Health Research on how race, ethnicity, language, and culture affects health and the equity or quality of health care services. Jackie has worked with many organizations to evaluate their health interventions and communication about, how, about their work, including the Massachusetts Alliance on Teen Pregnancy and Circle of Health International. She started her career in public health, working on community outreach and case study development with the Montgomery County Health Department in Pennsylvania and with the Peace Corps as a community health specialist in the Dominican Republic. Originally from Pennsylvania, with roots in community organizing and service learning, Jackie holds bachelor's degree in biology and psychology 
and a master's degree in public health from Boston University. She is fluent in Spanish and learning French. Dr. Mary Ann Etibet has two decades of experience improving healthcare outcomes for underserved populations and transforming healthcare deliveries, delivery at the front lines. She serves as AVP for health equity at Merck and the lead of Merck for Mothers. Merck's $500 million global health initiative to help create a world where no woman has to die giving life. Since 2011, Merck for Mothers program and partnerships have resulted in healthy pregnancies and safe deliveries for over 13 million mothers in 50 countries. Building on her experience as a physician, researcher, implementer, funder and advocate across the public, private and global development sectors, Dr. Etibet brings a diverse set of perspectives to advancing health equity. She joined Merck from Premier Inc, where she was a principal consultant in the population health management team. Previously, she served as director of ambulatory care strategies for New York City Health and Hospital. Her work in global health includes serving as senior technical advisor of the Institute of Human Virology Nigeria, a PEPFAR implementing partner while she was assistant professor, Division of Infectious Disease at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Etibet holds a MD and MBA from Yale University. She completed her residency in internal medicine at New York Presbyterianville Cornell and fellowship in infectious disease hospital system at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center. Becoming board certified in both internal medicine and infectious diseases. She is a member of the Center of Global Development Board of Directors, the Board of Trustee of Vital Strategies and the Advisory Committee for the Pazin Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Health Equity Leadership at Yale University. She also serves as the private sector representative on the Wearell Health Organization, HWO, who hosted partnership for maternal, newborn, and child health board, and the investors group of the World Bank's global financing facility. And lastly, born and raised in Akron, House Democratic leader, Emilia Strong Sykes, was elected to represent her hometown of Ohio District 34 in November, 2014, with a strong sense of responsibility for well-being of those that she served. Sykes has tackled the challenges of her district with unmatched passion and dedication. Sykes serves as Democratic leader of the House Minority Caucus, a position to which she was elected by her colleagues. Representative Sykes, has worked with healthcare professionals and colleagues in, to improve public health, increase access to care, and combat Ohio's high infant mortality rate. Her passion for social justice extends to issues such as voters' rights, criminal justice reform, a more efficient social net, social safety net for struggling Ohioans, and an end to domestic violence. Sykes works work on domestic violence issue has earned bipartisan praise and results in her legislation to protect people in dating relationships, House Bill 1 becoming law. Sykes previously served as administrative staff advisor at the Summit County Fiscal Office, where she worked to establish a county-led bank for, to repurpose vacant and abandoned properties. At Community Legal Services in Akron, Sykes offered access to equity health, excuse me, quality health and legal services to people in need. She also served as law clerk 
to the Chief Justice of U.S. Bankruptcy Court in the Northern District of Georgia. Sykes attended Kent State University, graduating magnum cum laude with a BA in psychology. She later attended the University of Florida, where she earned a Juris Doctorate with a certificate in family law from the Levin College, the Levin College of Law and a Master's of Public Health from the College of Public Health and Health Professions. And now I will turn it over to Jackie. Welcome everyone. So actually, um, Madam President, I'm I'm going to go first, and I, I wish I could have you introduce me at you know all all my talks. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, we are we are so excited uh, to be here and and share the work um, of uh, work from others at our companies, as you mentioned, five hundred million dollar initiative uh, that was created to uh, help create a world where no woman has to die while giving life, um, and. I think we are. We have a slide deck that we are. We're going to try and put up as as well, um, so that that will be great. And and we really hope that um, we have um, a really robust Q and A and discussion. And we also would love to hear uh, what all of you leaders are doing, uh, because I, I know you you are doing work, uh, you know, on this issue uh, as well. Um, so um, as uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, Work for Mothers is our, our company's global initiative uh, to help end preventable maternal deaths. And we came into this space uh, because um, it was not solved. Um, at, around the world and in the US, uh, you know, women were still dying from preventable causes. Um, and we thought that bringing some of the private sector approaches, um, expertise that you know we could help solve for this global challenge uh, in in new ways. Next slide, please. And so we we tackle this you know through a number of different uh, ways, uh, but at the heart of it, uh, it's taking a holistic approach to addressing the myriad of factors that are impacting maternal health, uh, and we do that through collaborations uh, and, and, and grants. Uh, with organizations large uh, like the World Health Organization uh, to community-based organizations um, in, you know, in Philadelphia. I think you mentioned <laughs> you're from Philadelphia. Um, the, the focus of the programs are advancing high quality maternity care. Uh, you know, we actually know from, from data, this is, uh, most, most of this is actually from low middle income countries but 60% um, of the preventable deaths are due to a lack of quality uh, of care and not lack of access to care. And so one of the things we focused on is making sure that wherever, whenever a uh, woman receives care, um, it's high quality. And I'll talk a bit more about what we're doing uh, in that space in the US. Um, we also know uh, that the solutions can't be the same everywhere. Um, and we want to make sure that we're actually responding, uh, you know, to the specific needs uh, of communities. Uh, but not only that, that community voices, women's voices uh, are integrated into our solutions and are part of how we do that work. And we think that, you know, not only is it the right thing to do, uh, but it, it makes us more effective um, and, and uh, our program more impactful. And then last but not least, uh, you know, thinking about what are the new innovations, uh, whether it's innovations in products, innovations in service delivery models, innovations in partnerships, uh, innovations in financing uh, that we can bring to this problem because uh, we're, we're going to need, uh, you know, all of the creative thinking uh, we can bring to bear uh, for what has been really an intractable issue uh, for decades. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about work from others. Uh, you know, we're really proud that in the 10 years of our existence, uh, our partners have been able to reach over 13 million women, uh, promoting safe, high quality, uh, and respectful care. Uh, we're in over 50 countries. Um, we've supported uh, over 100 different programs, uh, working uh, through at least uh, you know, 200 different types of organizations. Um, we not only um, impact, you know, the individual 
uh, the health and well-being of, of individual women, uh, but we also make it a point to do so in a way that uh, leaves something behind, that strengthens health systems um, so that that higher level quality of care is also available for families and other folks uh, in the community. So whether that's through training of healthcare providers, uh, I mentioned the improving quality of, of facilities, or making sure that folks have access uh, to life-saving products. And all of this you know, matters uh, because we, we know how important mothers are. Um, when a mother uh, lives, you know, her infant is 15 more times likely to survive. Uh, her children are 10 times more likely to finish school. And all a loss you know, of a mom has such an impact on families and communities. Uh, you know, our family, you know, has has also experienced uh, you know this type of loss, and you know we we are lucky. Uh, you know that um, our niece, uh, you know, who, who was left behind, you know, when when her mother died about I think twenty five years ago now. Um, you know, she is you know a beautiful young woman. Uh, you know, thinking about how she can contribute. You know, to this issue as well. Next slide. So I, I'm sure I don't have to share with all of you just how stark the inequities are in the US uh, and how this is something that you know, we can't you know, tolerate. Um, not only have the maternal mortality uh, rates risen uh, you know, in the past so, you know, 30 years, um, this actually, we're the only high income country, uh, you know, that has seen uh, right, rates rising as opposed to decreasing, uh, but the racial disparities are stark and persistent. Um, Black and Native American women are two to three times more likely to die uh, due, due to preventable causes um, from pregnancy or childbirth complications. And when you actually dig down, uh, you know, into cities, that disparity is greater. You know, so for example, in New York City, where I, I live, um, the disparity is between eight to 12 times more. Um, and that has also increased, you know, over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Uh, you know, in the early 200s, uh, that difference, you know, was between four to six times. And so, you know, not, not only do we have these disparities, but in many cases, they're getting wider. And one of the things we've asked ourselves as an initiative is, you know, if we are not having an impact uh, on closing that disparities gap, what, what are we doing wrong? <laughs> you know, what, what, how, what, what are the unintended consequences of, you know, some of the, you know, work, you know, that we're investing in? And how do we really uh, make sure that we are holding a mirror up to ourselves and our work um, to understand uh, you know, that? Um, next slide, please. And so you know, I wanted to share with you, you know, some of what we've done in the past you know, 10 years, but also share a little bit of, about our learnings you know, uh, of this work and how that's really informed you know, our focus on our strategy now on reducing the uh, inequities we see in, in maternal health. Um, so the, the first thing we did, um, and, I, and I think, um, you know, uh, it's safe to say this, that 10 years ago, you didn't see the types of headlines you see now uh, about uh, the poor state of maternal health uh, and the inequities uh, in maternal health. And part of that, we believe, is because, you know, the data wasn't there. People weren't looking at the issue. And so one of the first things we did was to invest uh, in, you know, evidence and data generation so we could share, you know, what we suspected was, you know, was happening, but, but we had the data to back it up. And many of you are policymakers, so you know how important data is, you know, to making the case uh, and, and um, you know, having that policy, uh, you know, successful policy change. Yeah. So the, the, one of the first things we did was support the CDC uh, to make sure that they're counting and investigating every death uh, through maternal mortality committees. When we started, uh, there were only about like 20, 22 states uh, that had functioning uh, committees. Uh, now, uh, you know, through the investments that we made in capacity building, 
um, and making sure that uh, you know data, you know data resources and other resources were able to be shared across states, learning across states. Um, there, there has been legislation passed with funding behind it uh, that is continuing that work. So I think now there's I think 45 or 46 states you know that have high quality functioning maternal mortality review boards. Uh, the other thing I'm really proud that we've done in this space is making sure that community voices and women's voices are actually part of the review committees um, so that their experiences and their recommendations you know, are included. Um, we, as I mentioned, you know, we've also focused on improving quality, um, but many of you uh, know that and there's data uh, from New York City uh, on this as well, that you know, a black woman and a white woman uh, you know, can go into the same hospital, uh, you know, with kind of the same characteristics, you know, same pre-existing conditions and have different outcomes. So what, you know, what's happening? Um, what ha what's happening is, is systemic racism and the impact on that uh, in the type of care uh, that is received in many facilities. Uh, and so while we have, um, uh, really invested in improving the quality of care and facilities, what we've learned is that's not enough. Uh, because even though uh, you may improve, um, you know, average, uh, you know, uh, average rates uh, or average outcomes, when you actually dig uh, down deep, and California has had this experience, uh, the disparities still persist. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, we started to explore was, okay, you know, what, what is happening um, and how do we understand um, what's happening in the hospitals? Uh, and what we've learned is that black women are not being listened to. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, we don't need a research project to tell us that. Uh, but again, you know, this provided, uh, you know, more, more data um, and, and more examples that were used to make changes in, in hospitals. So it's really, how do we make sure that we're empowering women as advocates um, so that they are able uh, to uh, not only be uh, listened to, but be heard and be responded to in the right way. Um, and then lastly, and, and Jackie will talk uh, a lot more about this, is really focusing on integrating community approaches that address the social determinants of health. Uh, and we're doing this primarily through a new initiative called the Safer Childbirth Cities Initiative. Um, and uh, you'll learn more about that later. Uh, next slide, please. Make sure I'm on time. Um, this, this is um, uh, our um, trailer. <laughs> and I'll, I'll have Jackie play it. So I, I think a number of you noticed that the audio is not working. Um, you know, there, there were the subtitles there. I apologize uh, for that. Uh, but, but really what, what that trailer was saying um, is that unless you are including in these committees the voices of the community, the voices of the woman, and having a health equity framework, you're really losing information uh, about what is driving uh, you know, these deaths. And if you don't have that information, you're not going to be able to design the right solutions. And uh, the work that we're doing is really working to embed a health equity framework in all of the work uh, around maternal mortality, not just that we invest in, uh, but that, uh, you know, the rest of um, the community is best investing in through our advocacy efforts. 
and we'll, I think what we can do, um, uh, Representative Camper, is that you know we can share the link, you know, to the video uh, for you to share with with your members, and and you know you're welcome to use it, uh, you know, uh, in any which way you, you would like. Next slide, please. And so I mentioned Safer Childbirth Cities, uh, which we are really proud of. Um, we, it was launched in, back in 2018, uh, where we um, sent out kind of requests for proposals all across the country uh, for communities to tell us what would work uh, in terms of reducing maternal mortality in their communities and are supporting uh, community-based coalitions. Uh, many of them, most of them actually led by uh, women of color uh, now in 20 cities. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, hand over the reins now to Jackie Caglia, who's our director of US programs to talk more uh, about our Safer Childbirth Cities initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne. And uh, thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you today about some of the work that we're supporting here in the United States in order to really work with communities to tackle the root causes of these disparities and differences in maternal health outcomes as a way to promote equity for all related to pregnancy and childbirth. Uh, as Marianne shared, we, through the Safer Childbirth Cities Initiative, we're now supporting projects that are local-led coalitions in 20 cities across the U.S. Um, you see those uh, here on the slide. The black stars are our first cohort of cities, and the blue stars are the city-based projects that were launched earlier this year. Um, we hope in the future to be able to support future rounds and uh, fill this map with more stars uh, all across the U.S. Um, the Safer Childbirth Cities projects are really structured as local-led projects tackling local issues with local solutions. And so while there are a number of threads of commonality across the projects that are happening in those 20 cities, uh, no one project is just like another. Uh, and that's really intentional and by design um, because what we're hoping to create here is to catalyze bringing folks together all around the table and looking at local data and what's happening in their own city with the birthing hospitals across their city, with the community-based supports that are in place for pregnant and birthing people in their own city, and also looking at the challenges that people are facing related to receiving prenatal care around labor and delivery, and particularly in that first 12 month period after childbirth. Um, I won't walk you through uh, the specifics of each of these uh, elements. Feel free to read them on the slide um, as I'm sharing an example. Um, but what I would like to do is uh, share with you a little bit about one of the projects that we're supporting um, here in, in Philadelphia in the city where I live. Um, and so as part of our, our first cohort of the Safer Childbirth Cities Initiative, we were able to uh, support grants to two coalitions in the state of Pennsylvania, one in Philadelphia and one in Pittsburgh. And here in Philadelphia, um, the city has the, the first city level maternal mortality review committee. So not only uh, does the state have a maternal mortality review board, but there are folks coming together at a city level to look specifically at what is happening in Philadelphia. And based on their findings, we know that over the period from 2013 to 2018, that 43% of the births across the city of Philadelphia were among non-Hispanic Black women. And we know that for that same period of time, 73% of the pregnancy-related deaths um, during that time were among those Black women. And so that really points to us that there is a disproportionate burden among our Black population here in Philadelphia and really points us in the direction of where we need to focus to address these challenges that are faced. 
Um, another critical element of the project here in Philadelphia is understanding more about when and where and why and how those women are experiencing complications um, and encountering challenges. And so we know from the city level analysis that nearly half, almost half of all of the pregnancy related deaths here in Philadelphia are connected to cardiovascular issues. Um, cardiovascular issues that either existed before pregnancy or were exacerbated or catalyzed um, during the pregnancy episode. And so knowing that really points the local folks leading the project in the right direction towards the most impactful interventions. And so they are working now on implementing a cardiovascular health program, as well as a post-pregnancy monitoring program across all of the birthing hospitals here in the city of Philadelphia in order to provide more wraparound care with a particular focus on the challenges that women are experiencing. Uh, something else that is uh, ex exciting about that project in particular from a policy perspective as well is the local maternal mortality review committee, um, when they came out with their most recent report, issued 33 recommendations for actions that could be taken at the local and state uh, policy and practice level in order to address the challenges that, that people are facing uh, around pregnancy and childbirth in Philadelphia. And as a result of the coalition that we've helped fund and bring together through the Safer Childbirth Cities work, um, that report was released in March and it is, we just turned the calendar into June and the Safer Childbirth Cities team has uh, plans in place and already up and running to address one third of those recommendations um, within a two month period. Uh, I think that's pretty impressive and really shows you how um, we're hoping to spark more collective action uh, and the, really the power of bringing people together around a common focus in order to address these challenges. Something else important related to the Safer Childbirth Cities initiative that we wanted to share with you is um, that we're also supporting a uh, national community of practice. And this community of practice is bringing together grantees across the 20 city-based projects so that they're able to share insights and learn from each other, talk about what's working, talk about what's not working. If something works in Chicago and the team in Baltimore wants to try it, they're able to join hands and, and learn from each other. That community of practice is being facilitated and led by the folks at the Association for Maternal and Child Health Programs. And we're really excited about having the AMCHIP team in the lead there uh, in implementing the community of practice because of the critical role that they then play in being the supportive agency that works with maternal and child health directors across the US. And so they're able to facilitate key connections within these city-based coalitions up into the state level actors, as well as folks um, operating on the federal stage related to forward-looking uh, interventions and support around continuing to improve maternal and child health. We're also excited this year that we've layered on a collaboration with uh, the team at the National Birth Equity Collaborative within the community of practice. And they are working on creating a, a simple set of harmonized indicators that are looking at patient level outcomes. Um, what's changing for the women and the families who are participating in these programs that are being implemented across the Safer Childbirth Cities Initiative. And so over the next 18 months, we'll be looking forward to learning more from the case studies uh, and papers that they'll be developing uh, around what's working. Another element that we wanted to share with you today <clears throat> that we're also supporting connected to the Safer Childbirth Cities Initiative is a grant through the team at Ariadne Labs that is um, really has created um, what they're referring to as a maternal well-being city dashboard. And so they've created this dashboard looking at not only maternal health indicators at a city level, they can actually go down into the census track and zip code levels, 
Um, but they're also looking at the social determinants and the community supports, the services, the things in the environment um, that are needed in order to support families to thrive um, in, in their city. And so this maternal well-being city dashboard has just been pilot tested in three cities across the US, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and in New York City. Uh, the team wanted to work uh, within three cities that were different sizes and shapes in order to uh, test out the benefits of looking at information in this way in order to support um, further conversations around uh, improvements to policy and practice. Um, so there will be uh, an exciting uh, white paper that's published about the, the findings of this initial pilot of the maternal well-being city dashboard. And the team does hope to be able to move this dashboard to a place where um, you'll be able to uh, go on it someday, should it be of interest to you, and type in information about um, the, the jurisdictions that you represent and, and learn more about um, these particular indicators and how they're connected to maternal health outcomes. Um, finally, another element that we wanted to make sure you were aware of connected to the Safer Childbirth Cities Initiative is that we have a principle within uh, how we work uh, across the Merck for Mothers Initiative, and that's that we try to never go it alone. And so the work that we are supporting uh, is work that we are also supporting in a collective way through collaborative grant making with a number of other philanthropic partners across the country. And we're excited about this because not only does it allow us to um, model that collective action and the coming together that we're trying to create across the coalitions working at the city level and also connecting to each other, but it creates an opportunity for us to bring additional funding and additional support to the table in order to address these challenges that we face in maternal health, especially among Black pregnant and birthing people across the U.S. So um, wanted to share with you a few um, pieces of additional information of where you can go to learn more. Um, and I'll also uh, include a couple of these links in the chat um, as soon as I'm done sharing my screen. Um, but if you visit saferchildbirthcities.com and can learn more about each of the specific projects that we're supporting across the country, who the lead grantees are, what are some of the activities that they're working on. Um, this website is also um, where we post uh, news and information and updates. And so uh, as more uh, case studies and insights are coming out from the projects as they move through implementing their activities, um, all of that will be housed on this website. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, we also were, were thinking hard about uh, recommendations, calls to action that we could share um, with each of you related to this issue. Um, and sort of, um, there are two uh, things that we wanted to make sure that you were aware of. Um, the first is uh, that we now officially recognize uh, Black Maternal Health Week uh, during the week of April 11th through 17th on an annual basis. Um, this was launched by the Black Mamas Matter Alliance um, based out of Atlanta, Georgia, and was recognized this year um, through a presidential proclamation. Um, and we, we hope that it's something that you're aware of. Uh, and if not, we hope it's something that you can potentially join us in as we look ahead to 2022. Uh, we also uh, are supporters of uh, 123, uh, January 23rd, uh, Maternal Health Awareness Day. There are several states across uh, the country. Uh, I believe Tennessee is one. Um, I believe Pennsylvania and New Jersey are as well, um, that now recognize on an annual basis um, January 23rd as Maternal Health Awareness Day. Um, so wanted to encourage you to learn more about both of those initiatives and think about their potential relevance um, within your purview. We also wanted to share with you uh, resources that are available um, through the campaign that Marianne mentioned um, that's being led by the CDC, the Hear Her campaign. Uh, and through this 
campaign, um, we now have available um, predominantly in English and Spanish, but just new this week um, in 12 additional languages, information and resources, not only around the recognition of warning signs connected to potential complications around pregnancy and childbirth, but also tools for family members, for support partners, um, and for providers around how to listen and look out for um, signs and symptoms that um, people may be experiencing around pregnancy and childbirth. And then finally, um, if any of you happen to have a, an ongoing interest and time in your schedule for next week, um, we are, are one of three organizations co-sponsoring a workshop through the National Academies of, of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that will be focused on how do we advance maternal health equity across the US. Um, and so there are a number of experts who are coming together uh, next week on the 7th and 8th for a virtual workshop and we look forward to learning more at that time and uh, invite you all to join us. Uh, in many ways, it's sort of a, a dream dinner party of experts across the country coming together, uh, if, only, if only we were in person. Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure and I look forward to hearing now from a Representative Sykes as, and to opening up for dialogue and conversation with you all. Thank you. Hi everyone, am I just ready to get going? Okay, Leader Camper, I think I hear you saying yes. And I apologize if I missed anything. I was having some technical difficulties uh, per usual as it tends to happen with us figuring out our uh, COVID conversations. So uh, thank you uh, to Leader Camper for um, inviting me to join you all today and to the entire Noble Women team. Uh, Jacqueline, really appreciated hearing your presentation as well. And hopefully um, I am able to add something of substance to the conversation as we talk about this incredibly important issue of uh, maternal mortality. So again, my name is Amelia Sykes. I am the state representative for Ohio's 34th House District, which is based in uh, the city of Akron. Uh, and I also serve as the minority leader in the Ohio House of Representatives. I'm thrilled to be here with you um, from afar uh, and look forward to connecting with you all in person in the very, very near future. And I'm hopeful that you all are happy and healthy and sane as we are finding our way out of uh, this COVID crisis, but now talking about another crisis, which is incredibly important, which is maternal health. Uh, so no matter what state we come from, whether it's a red state or a blue state or a purple state, our constituents all want the same thing. They want to be able to work and retire with safety and security, to have access to a quality of life, uh, to afford, they want to be able to afford their health care and live out their American dream. Key word there, live out their American dream. But for far too many people here in the United States, uh, the promise of a better life and a brighter future is becoming increasingly more difficult to attain. And again, I'm going to highlight the word life there. Uh, as a lawmaker and someone with a background in public health, uh, but most importantly, as a black woman in America, I know that too many women who look like me face incredible obstacles getting the quality of care that they need when looking to start or grow a family. And here in Ohio, these obstacles have been devastating and probably not much different than what you've seen in other states. And the impact on black moms and babies uh, is really, really devastating. Our state ranks amongst the worst for black infant mortality. It was an issue that I took on very early in my career as a legislator. Uh, and what became very clear in those conversations was that if we're very we were very concerned about infant mortality, but you're not going to have healthy babies if you don't have healthy moms. And the conversation almost solely identified and revolved around the infants, which certainly no one is complaining about. Uh, but we need to move that upstream, a little public health term for you, um, to try to figure out the best ways to handle this. And I'll tell a quick story before um, I move on. I was working with a colleague of mine who 
was very much engaged in the infant mortality conversation with me. And I really appreciated him. He was uh, a Republican member, uh, but still would, you know, hang in there with me when I was, you know, giving him the best of uh, social determinants of health conversations. And one day we were discussing safe sleep environments. And he said, oh, it's so great that we've got this opportunity. We can uh, give these women, these parents, these new, new families pack and plays. So we keep, we were talking about, um, couch surfing, which was a term he had never heard of. And he says, you know, we've got these moms and, you know, they're really concerned. They're keeping their babies close. They don't want to put them down. They want to stay next to them, which, you know, makes complete and total sense, especially if you're someone who is experiencing homelessness uh, and you want your baby as close to you as possible, but it's not always the safest thing to do. So he was so excited about these pack and plays. And I said, well, you know, representative, aren't you concerned about mom sleeping on couches, just random people's couches? And he said, but we've got the pack and plays. I said, yeah, but you know, but what about mom? Like, you know, if she's sleeping on somebody's couch. You don't know who, what they've been doing on that couch. It's not her couch. And what about her and her well being? And it just never, ever occurred to him that he, and we should also be talking about the women and the people who are uh, birthing these beautiful infants and their well being. And so that started my journey. Um, to push towards maternal health and maternal mortality in this state, uh, because truly you cannot have infants, infants that are healthy if you don't have the people who are carrying them are, are not healthy either. Uh, and so we st started that discussion and, and boy, it has not been as easy as it has been talking about infant health, um, but nonetheless, we are up uh, to the challenge. So, you know, we live in one of the most developed nations on the earth. You all know that. And here in Ohio, we have some of the best health systems in the world. Uh, we'll take full credit for that. But if we could have figured out this issue in doctor's offices and hospital settings, we wouldn't have an issue with maternal health or infant health in Ohio, in Ohio or across this country, because that's not where it is. And we are seeing Black women dying at rates far greater than our white counterparts. In Ohio, Black women are two to three times more likely than white women to die from pregnancy or giving birth. And it's not just the usual culprits that people like to say, which they point to um, not being married or not having stable housing or having a certain kind of income. We have seen this um, with infant mortality as well as with maternal health that no matter a person's economic status, if they are black and they identify as a woman, their likelihood of mortality or morbidity greatly increases with all of those protective risk factors, those protective factors that normally are in place that help minimize these uh, negative outcomes. And as, how, as heartbreaking as this is, and what's so maddening to me about this crisis is that it is very much preventable. Uh, in fact, there is a report uh, about a year and a half ago that showed that in Ohio, uh, over 50% of the pregnancy related deaths were deemed preventable. I mean, just think about that, preventable. This did not happen. To happen. These people did not have to die. These families did not have to go out, go without a, a loved one, a caregiver, a parent. Um, but that was due to systemic failures um, in these organizations and these different resources that were there to, to protect life. They were not able to. And that's the worst part of all of this. Uh, we've long talked about addressing the social determinants of health, those quality of life indicators that deeply impact one's health and well-being. And we're getting there. Uh, it's It's we got to pull people along and they're not quite always there. And it certainly depends on the politics of your state, but it is a conversation that we're having and one that is growing in popularity um, and happy to lead it. In Ohio and across the country, inequities amongst these social determinants have led to significant racial health disparities that continue to harm communities of color like mine um, and probably like many of yours across the country. And we know that if we close some of these gaps and increasing access to quality, affordable pre, post, and pre and postnatal care, we can make improvements to ensure healthier moms and babies and to save lives. But it's not just about uh, the talk. We need to walk the walk. And that was uh, something that was very important to us here in Ohio. So in 2019, we created the nation's first ever state level Black Maternal Health Caucus, a group of primarily Black women legislators who are working to find solutions and implement strategies that will help improve the health outcomes and save lives. And we're starting to see results. Uh, we've increased money uh, to address infant mortality that happened in our last budget. Um, our current budget has uh, funding to expand Medicaid postnatal care from six 
60 days to a year. Uh, hopefully that remains in the budget. So keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> You've got a little bit of ways to go. Uh, there's also some language to designate May is Maternal Mortality Awareness Month. And I'll tell you, I introduced that bill uh, three years ago. And in committee, if you could have seen faces that had never heard those four words strung together um, and it was not well received, and here we are, it's uh, going to be implemented again in the budget. Fingers crossed. I see you, Jacqueline. Thank you, sister. Um, we've introduced the Legislation to Save Our Mothers Act from Representative Crawley from uh, the Columbus area. Uh, it's a bill that would improve the cultural competency training and tackle race, racial bias in healthcare. Representative Stephanie House from Cleveland uh, passed last General Assembly some legislation to improve prenatal dental care for Ohio's uh, women and pregnant people. Uh, we introduced a resolution to declare racism as a public health crisis. That one's been a little bit tricky in the state, but we still have it. Uh, and we also have a bill to um, ensure that doulas are able to receive Medicaid uh, reimbursements uh, because we know that doulas are a very important advocacy tool um, for people experiencing uh, birth and having someone with them who can help them through that journey. So we're doing the work, uh, we're getting there uh, slowly but surely, but just having the synergy from the Black women legislators who are here uh, has been very helpful and allowed us to highlight and bring to the forefront these, these issues. Uh, we've been engaging the public, we've been offering solutions and fighting to make a difference. And I'm very proud of the work that we're done, that we've been doing. And I'm mostly um, excited about the women who I get to work with in doing it. But the Black Maternal Health Caucus is, I'm just gonna take our little victory lap here, is only possible because of us, uh, because of black women who ran for office, who stood up to represent our communities and the issues that impact us. And this is why representation is so important and groups like Noble Women is so important so that we can connect and share these ideas uh, so we can help our communities the best. Uh, we know that when black women are in office, the policy discourse changes. It becomes a whole lot more equitable and a lot more people's lives get a lot better if you start to implement the things that we do. The only problem is there's just not enough of us. Uh, so we're working on that part uh, every day, but it was in Ohio, a black woman in Charlita Tavares who led the conversation on infant mortality many, many years ago that opened the door for us to start talking about maternal mortality. Um, and many of us have taken that baton and run kick down doors, quite frankly, in order to talk about the needs that we have in protecting the people uh, who are not only our constituents, but us, uh, those of us who are actually experiencing this and can talk about it with pure emotion, sincerity, and honesty because we are living this ourselves. And so we're in charge of this. You know, it makes a difference, leader camper, when you got a leader who's a black woman uh, and you can set these, set the agenda and bring these issues to the forefront. And that's what we're doing. And that's what I'm doing with my position as well. Uh, but as for as much as we talk about the work that we're doing with the Black Maternal Health Caucus um, and the very specific pregnancy and healthcare related things, we are also discussing the quality of life issues that women are facing and pregnant people are facing, including uh, just supporting the Ohio Fairness Act that says that LGBTQ people deserve um, adequate treatment and care and don't deserve to be discriminated against. Uh, we have bills that talk about ending hair discrimination. And you know, if you see me, a couple pictures, my hair look different, just depending on how humid it is outside. Uh, so we just wanna make sure people have that type of protection so they can keep a job and have a job. Um, when I was in graduate school, I worked with some researchers who showed that if you increase the minimum wage or you make the earned income tax refundable, you decrease the infant mortality rate and you increase people's quality of life. We're pushing every day to expand the earned in the earned income tax credit in Ohio and to increase the minimum wage to at least $15 an hour. Uh, Childcare accessibility, uh, economic opportunities and housing, these are all issues that are very important to us as a Black Maternal Health Caucus. Um, and we know that not only is it going to impact Black people, uh, Black women, and Black families, but really the entire state of Ohio. If they just stick with us and work with us, we're going to help everybody out because that's what we do. Uh, and so I just want to say again, thank you to uh, Noble Women for organizing this conversation, to Merck uh, and the team for uh, your guidance and your expertise, and really look forward to any questions if there is any time. Wow, thank you, all three of our presenters. That was great information. And uh, what a way to end with uh, Representative Sykes talking about 
all the great things that's happening in uh, Ohio and you'll have to share it with the body so that the rest of us can come together and do some of the great things that, that you're doing there. Uh, a couple of things you did uh, mention uh, were some things we did here in Tennessee with our young uh, uh, Representative London Lamar, who is the only member in our general assembly of childbearing age. And so she's been fighting uh, for that. So I, I'm sure she'll be encouraged by uh, all the things that you all are doing. And maybe you can be a resource and encourage her and uh, help her as she, she's trying to fight all of these issues. And uh, thank you, Merck, for all the great information you provided and all the great things that you're doing. Uh, it's very helpful to our members uh, as we're preparing to go into the next General Assembly, give us time in our off session to, you know, uh, tap into some of the resources that you have, help us in formulating ideas and, and, and legislative packages. So I really appreciate that. I did see that in the chat, we had a couple of questions and I don't know if any of you saw those, but there was a question from, um, uh, uh, was it, let me, oops, sorry. She had, she, she left, I think she probably had another meeting, but there was a question and I told her, uh, um, uh, Sims for Senate that I would ask them. And one. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm here. Thank you. Oh, you're back. Okay. I saw that you had left. Okay. So go ahead and ask your question. They yes, were very I'm important. You one need, so please, I'm still with you. Yeah. Go ahead. Ask that question. Yes, ma'am. You can go ahead and ask him. I'm, I'm kind of in and out. Okay. One was, in, was dealing with uh, the environment, and one was dealing with rural. So uh, I, I, I I logged out of the chat, but it's a, I I have it. Um, I can see. Okay, it. thank you so Perfect. much. Appreciate Amber, that. Thank yes. you. So the the first question was, you thank know, you. what are thank you? Of course, and and thank you for the question. Um, what are you doing to reach uh, the rural areas in in Charles County, um, Maryland? And you know, this this is such a great question because we know that inequities are not limited to uh, you know the, the urban you know urban cities um, but we, we had to kind of make you know an investment decision about where we wanted to focus at least at this point in time and looking at the data uh, you know the inequities were the greatest you know from um, uh, in the cities um, and so that that's where we have focused that safer childbirth cities initiative. Um, some of the coalitions, you know, do kind of re reach out, uh, you know, um, uh, out outside of, you know, quote unquote city limits. But the other thing that we're seeing is um, uh, connectivity between the coalitions at the city level and what's happening at the state level. Mm -hmm. And having that now influence, you know, uh, state activities, state, state policies, state programs, that do reach out into rural areas. Um, the, the other thing that we're doing um, is kind of just informing, you know, some of the national, including HRSA efforts uh, to improve um, healthcare access and quality in rural areas. So we, we are involved in that, um, just, you know, in a different way. That's, that's right, Marianne, if I could just add on to that, um, because it may be of interest to the group, um, one of the national efforts that we are an advisor on is um, focused on how to support healthcare facilities that don't uh, regularly uh, handle deliveries, be ready in case um, someone shows up in need of delivery services. Um, we know when we look across the country that one of the biggest challenges facing our rural communities is actually hospital closures and the closures of ob yeah. departments. And so there's a big focus right now on how do we elevate the level of obstetric readiness of all providers. So if someone shows up in an ER, if someone shows up in primary care, if someone goes to the hospital that's closest to them, how do we help create a system that is ready to respond to any complications? Um, so we are advising um, that national effort and um, through the HRSA, there recently was um, an additional commitment that's focused on that particular initiative as well. And then the other question was around environmental climate justice concerns and, and the linkage to 
Black maternal health. And I'm so glad you, you brought up you know, that linkage and, and thinking about that critical you know, social determinant of health you know, Jackie mentioned the um, City Wellbeing Index, you know, that that is being developed. Um, and, you know, a part of that, you know, we'll, we'll look at, you know, some of those policies and contexts, you know, around uh, environmental issues um, and, and the lived environment. And so we're, we're, we're hopeful that through that, uh, there's increased uh, awareness and visibility um, of uh, not just the issues, but um, policies that, you know, that are being enacted, you know, in the different cities, uh, you know, to address that. And we, Thank you. And that's, that's a great question as well about the environmental health and uh, Representative House, who is a member of our Black Maternal Health Caucus, as well as uh, someone who has an engineering degree in environmental engineering degree. Uh, she often uses those intersections to think through uh, the ways that our uh, as uh, Dr. Edibet said, our lived environment and what does water quality look like and air quality look like? And, and unfortunately in Ohio, we haven't been able to, we're still trying to convince people that taking care of women is a good thing to do because the conversation immediately turns to abortion, uh, which yeah, we can talk about it, but there's a lot of other things that women's bodies do and need help with besides just that. And so uh, trying to get people out of that conversation uh, makes it very challenging. And I say that because we are we struggle with the data around this. And so we have a lot of data around infant health and infant mortality and uh, many maps that you can do, the GIS overlaying and see where there are polluted areas of the community and wages and, and such, but we can't we don't have that yet for maternal health because again, once we start talking about maternal health, the only thing we can talk about is abortion. And so that's just where we struggle in that space with getting the information to do it. But you know, one quick thing I'll say is in this past year, uh, we had to fight an awful lot with our colleagues to eliminate and prohibit water shutoffs during the pandemic because yeah. it is, one, first of all, you know, we were trying to tell people they need to wash your hands and you can't wash your hands if you don't have any water. Uh, and two, you just need water for sustaining life. Uh, and then, you know, one of the interesting conversations I recall a colleague having was, okay, well, what does someone do when they have a baby and they're making formula? Like, and then we had to even, you know, talk about it in that sense. And they said, oh, okay, well, I guess we can keep these people's water on. And just thought, you know, I, <laughs> we're, all right, you guys, we, we see where we are, but you know, whatever we have been able to do and make the argument, um, we're trying to, but we've had to be really creative um, because again, people just don't wanna think about um, women. It's just really not uh, a cool topic to spend so much and devote so much energy to it. Um, but the environmental part is, I mean, really, really significant. And, and thank you for highlighting that. Uh, thank you thank for that. Thank you so much. Okay, go ahead, Representative. I was gonna say, I'm here. Thank you so much um, for um, answering those questions. Just one last thing, if I could. I'd like to know possibly have we explored what part mental health and wellness plays? We know what an impact it has on our community overall, but even when it comes to our, our Black women, the, pregnant, the whole pregnancy process, the social process, uh, what part does mental health play uh, when it comes to our, our, our maternal health? Thank you. I, I, um, Jackie knows that um, this is a question I, I, I love to answer, um, not, not because of the, the issue, but because we, we do need to um, raise awareness and kind of de-stigmatize and demystify um, the relationship between mental health and maternal health and just mental health in general. Um, you know, I, I will say for uh, one thing in the last, um, multi-state, you know, CDC report, uh, you know, that, that looked at the drivers of maternal mortality, mental health, uh, definitely you can see the trend in, in rising to the top. Um, it's actually um, number one, uh, you know, uh, mental health substance misuse for the Caucasian, um, uh, you know, um, when you, for, for Caucasian women. Um, so we're seeing that in that population. Um, from a 
you know, programmatic perspective, and I want to actually link back to the question about the environment and, and housing issues, I'm sorry, the, the environment and, and climate justice issues, you know, what has been so um, exciting about the Safer Childbirth Cities initiative is surfacing the diversity of issues and solutions these coalitions are bringing to the table, bringing to the community of practice that we can now share with folks like you. Um, and you know whether it's uh, you know specific focus, Jackie put in the chat around uh, the, the groups in New Orleans and Washington DC specifically looking at environmental and housing issues, and you know, at the end of these projects, we, you know, our plan is to share the insights and perspectives and learnings, you know, so that they can inform, you know, broader uh, policy, uh, you know, policy work. Uh, but also for mental health, we have a number of our safer childbirth cities um, coalitions that are have a very big focus on supporting the mental health needs. Um, of uh, the women that they're serving and making sure that it's integrated in a holistic way uh, to the care and their support that they're, they're receiving throughout the pregnancy uh, continuum, including, you know, postpartum, where we know, um, you know, that there is a very high risk, you know, not just of postpartum depression, you know, but other uh, serious uh, mental illness. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's something that one of the things we, we want to be able to do, and it's, it's coming out of these coalitions, is, is making sure that these services are paid for. Um, and, mm. uh, you know, that, that you know, is, is still a huge barrier uh, in, in many places. I don't know, Jackie, if you, there's anything else you'd like to add, uh, but there, there's so many innovative models, you know, of providing mental health services. And, and most recently during the COVID pandemic, uh, you know, we've seen an increased demand, you know, for those services, but our collaborators have still been able to meet that demand, you know, through, you know, new modalities of, you know, whether it's telemedicine or, you know, the, the kind of remote engagement, uh, you know, with clients. Thank, thank you for all of that, Marianne. The only thing that I would add is to point you in the direction of a true leader and subject matter expert on this topic uh, related specifically to Black maternal health. And that is our friend and colleague, Kay Matthews, who works out of Houston, Texas and leads the Shades of Blue project. She has developed some really innovative interventions um, that are uh, working in Texas and she's working with other groups of um, black led coalitions across the country in order to um, implement those interventions elsewhere in order to really dispel the stigma around talking about these issues. So I'd love um, for you to just learn more about Kay and, and her work. And if I could just uh, kind of bring this full circle in, and just be kind of a one-on-one -on -one and be very transparent about this because I, when we talk about you know black maternal health and the impact that it has and the legitimate problem that systemic racism causes to our health and well-being, I, I know I don't have to explain that to anyone here, but I just want to say it out loud so we don't think that we are in a space where it's just me or we're we're the only ones dealing with this um, because we face different experiences than uh, the white women who go through pregnancy. Um, and again, I'll tell a quick story as I was talking to that same colleague about not considering about the mom sleeping on the couch um, and he just couldn't understand the infant mortality issue and the racial disparities. And so I said to him one day, I said, well, listen, you know, when you come to work, do you ever get concerned about getting into the building? And he said, no, why would I ever be concerned about that? And so I expressed to him and shared with him my experience where I had been told by uh, the Capitol Police that I didn't look like a legislator. And so every time I came to work, I had this fight or flight uh, going through my body because I didn't know what kind of interaction I was gonna have with the police as I was getting into work. And so that was stressful. And to go through that four times a week, every week, for 30 weeks, because we're always in session, um, is just a completely different scenario and something that he didn't even consider. And so the only reason that, you know, that those patrol officers were able to say to me that I didn't look like a legislator and to stop me and to search me and to question me when I'm going to work with my pen and all my legislative stuff on is because I was a black woman. And that was just not an experience that 
any of the other white male legislators or the people making these decisions have. And we call the term in public health weathering when you're consistently being exposed to these death by a thousand cuts and it starts to wear on you. And I would liken it to, and, and maybe for those of you who live in Northern states, like the rust in your car, if you start seeing holes in your car because of that salt is just rubbing on it constantly. And then you eventually see a hole. And for so many black women who are just trying to live, just trying to make it, we have holes in our hearts because we are being constantly told that we don't belong someplace, uh, that we shouldn't be here, that you know, we show up at doctor's appointments excited about our pregnancies and you know, we're greeted with, well, how many kids is this? And do you have somebody to help you do this? And these yeah. are very real situations and they really impact people's health. So you know, the thing I'll, I'll finish with saying is you talk about black maternal health and um, the risk factors, but race is not the risk factor. It is racism. It is the exposure to racism that is the risk factor that harms us. Um, and getting to that is the burden that I want to lift off all of Black women and saying, it is now your problem, people who expose us to racism to deal with. It is not ours, and we don't want to continue to take it anymore um, because it is literally killing us. Uh, it is killing our families, it's killing our children, and you know we can go on to all kinds of conversations about racism as a public health crisis and how it harms us. Uh, but I do want us to as black women, especially those of us on this phone call and anyone else who we are associating, lift that burden off of us um, as best as we can and shift it onto the people who are creating the problem so that they mm -hmm. can fix it. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that uh, information and uh, making it real where people can clearly understand and having that dialogue with your colleague. Um, it chips away little by little, right? to allow us to move forward and open yet another mind. So uh, I, I really agree with you and appreciate you sharing that story and helping uh, uh, give advice to members of how we can kind of continue to move through uh, some of this. And were there any other questions in the chat that anyone saw? I, I remember in, in one of the presentations, it was something about uh, diabetes and some correlation uh, or did I mishear something about uh, uh, women being diagnosed with diabetes and the impact that's having on um, their ability to have a safe you know, pregnancy? Did someone talk about that? Maybe, I, maybe I, 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 it may have been it. more broadly cardiovascular disease. Um, okay, okay. You know that that uh, Jackie okay. mentioned in, in, okay. in Philadelphia, but but I you know. I, I think yeah, where thank you. Where I, you, I, you know, I it took a moment for me to get there and get it done, but um, I I must admit I was glad that um that someone it needs to be on mute. <laughs> um, I think where um you may be thinking about uh, and which is so important is, and I think um, Representative Skykes also said this that there's there's more to women, you know, than um, being pregnant. Um, and so when we are engaging with the healthcare system, even during pregnancy, um, the, the other, you know, chronic conditions that, uh, you know, we may be uh, dealing with need to also be addressed, you know, so whether that's diabetes or hypertension or mental health issues, how do you make it uh, easier um, and more convenient for women to receive the totality of the care that they need? not just to have that safe and healthy pregnancy, but to also set them up for a lifetime of, of health and well-being. And we know that you know, there's increased risk you know, to develop diabetes, whether it's gestational diabetes during pregnancy. When you have that, there's an increased risk of you know, having diabetes and the sequela of diabetes later on in life. Um, and, and we know that too often, um, there is no coordination or linkage, you know, between uh, providers uh, after, you know, a woman has received her pregnancy care. And so oftentimes, uh, you know, that, that, you know, that diagnosis goes on cared for, unmanaged. Um, and, you know, that, that's one of the things also that our collaborators are doing, making sure that there's integrated care for women uh, to help support, you know, all of their needs. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, our time is winding down. We have about six minutes left. I don't think there are any more questions 
in the uh, chat box. So I will allow- Madam President. To... Oh, yes. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Good. This is Representative Tony from Texas. Um, I just wanted to report, you know, the excitement and the victories that we did make this past legislative session. I, I legislative session actually ended on Monday. And so I know you all have heard we have a lot going on here in Texas with other things as well. But I was able to pass a maternal mortality bill this uh, legislative session. We didn't extend it uh, from, well, when it left the House, we uh, voted for 12 months. But over in the Senate, they cut it in half because of our um, lieutenant governor who basically runs the Senate. And so... Uh, I just want to share one of the perspectives that I approached it. You know, I was, you know, every a lot of these states are so concerned about expanding Medicaid, expanding Medicaid. So I told them I'm not expanding, I'm extending a benefit. And I also went to it from the perspective of this is a pro-life bill. You all want women to have babies. So now the woman is pregnant. And I wish you all could have seen the governor's face when I said it to him like that. I was like, look, you just this last week, you, you signed the heartbeat bill. I said, and so now you're telling women they have to have the baby. And so now the woman is pregnant and we're like, the hell with you? And so he, he was looking at me, he said, well, well, that's over in the Senate. He, I mean, he was just a stumbling because they didn't look at it from that perspective. They're so concerned. And I mean, I'm not trying to bring the pro-life debate and all that in this form, but it, that that's what the bill is. And so I'm just excited about this. So I just wanted to report. With that now he haven't signed it he upset with the democrats because we walked out the other day so hopefully he won't be petty <laughs> and i sign my bill but i tell you if he don't he's gonna have some real problems this upcoming uh election cycle but i'm just excited about that i didn't mean to interrupt the forum no that was i know great. texas has been you know we're on the news for all the crazy stuff so i just wanted to report one of the victories that we did have as it relates to maternal health uh this legislative session <laughs> thank you, thank you madam and that Thank was you, a, Madam President. Definitely a great way to uh, approach it. We got to find different angles, different ways of of of, of getting uh, our initiatives passed and creating a different dialogue around the things that we care about. So I really appreciate you sharing that with us. And we also uh, had other members that wanted to share some of their successes. Uh, Representative Brown, did you have anything you want to share? Yes, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I am Representative Camille Brown from Florida. Um, and we were, uh, we, we had some significant wins, uh, this year, uh, within the maternal health space. It's something I've kind of been working on for the past several years. Uh, but we were able to pass out this year, extending, uh, maternal, um, or Medicaid insurance from our 60 days to now 12 months. And so, um, that has been signed. Uh, by our governor, we also uh, put together a pilot program relating to telehealth. Um, and this year, you know, maternal health kind of hit different being that I was pregnant within a pandemic. And so uh, just hearing, just going through my experiences, um, but also just hearing from other constituents, uh, it was important that we established a telehealth program here in the state of Florida and make sure our moms were also equipped with supplies at home to do those telehealth services. And so there was uh, within the, the, the telehealth uh, program that was established, uh, there also uh, uh, money to also provide, um, you know, whether it's blood pressure kits, uh, whether it's um, monitors that, that many of our moms will need to make sure we have better um, outcomes for our babies. Uh, we were also able to work also within um, our health, this minority health disparity space. Uh, I sponsored a bill uh, that dealt with uh, our Office of Minority Health, putting uh, minority health liaisons um, in each county so that when we're providing many of these resources, these resources are coming down to our 67 counties. Um, we have our Close the Gap work program, which all before just deals specifically with certain um, health disparities such as your breast cancers. But this year we're also even allowing our doulas or those work, working within that maternal health space to also now apply for these uh, state grants relating to education. Um, and so uh, 
I am, uh, you know, I was happy to join this call to make sure we were um, able to see what else we can do. Uh, what would the benefit was, was that our, our leadership uh, wanted to do something, did not know what to do. And so, you know, we were ready and armed to go to our leadership, our speaker, to say, hey, these are some ideas and, and this is why it would work. Um, and so we were blessed to, you know, have leadership that was on the same page that allowed many of these um, pieces that passed this year, um, you know, see, uh, see it all the way through, but also make sure we champion them um, to get to the governor's desk and signed. Thank you for sharing that. Any other members had uh, some successes they wanted to, sh to share or just some of the initiatives that's going on in your state before we close out? Madam President, I just want to add to because uh, Representative Brown just made me think of something. It was important that we had our leadership on board too. And, you know, I was telling one of my colleagues, I said, maybe when they went to Alec, Alec may have told them, because I noticed that, you know, other states, <laughs> Georgia, and that was one of the things that kept ringing with me was Georgia just did six months. I said, well, just because Georgia did six, why do we have to do six? <laughs> <laughs> But I really think, and, and another thing is, you know, for every dollar that we spend, we would get $4 back. I mean, <laughs> why would we not do it? And so I just wanted to add that little piece. So it is important that you get your leadership on board with it. <laughs> Very good. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, all right, thank you all again for attending. I really appreciate my board members for getting on and, and participating. Merck, you've always been there for Nobel. We've had such a great relationship over the years. Again, it, it's just, I'm just overwhelmed that Terry Lee is on this phone, uh, on this Zoom call today. I can't wait to see you. And uh, appreciate you all's hard work and commitment to this issue and, and just all of the funds that you all have put forward to uh, help women across the globe, you know, deal with uh, maternal health. So uh, any party words you may have for Merck, for mothers, we'd appreciate it. The, the only parting word I have, Madam President, is, you know, thank all of you for, for the work you're doing because it's really the legislation that sustains uh, you know, the impact um, and uh, has lasting change. Uh, so, so thank you so much. You are welcome. Well, that, uh, oh, Terry Lee, thank you. I appreciate those nice comments in the chat from uh, Terry Lee and Marlene, appreciate you always bringing us together on these issues and making sure that we are uh, poor with thinking. Uh, when we're getting ready to go back in a session, I learned a lot uh, that we can do here in Tennessee. Uh, some of the stuff, you know, uh, Representative Lamar had already been working on stuff around doulas, public health crisis and that, but there's always more that we can do. And so Nobel stand ready, willing and able to partner with you all moving forward to get some of this stuff done. I see Representative Scott thanking everyone. Uh, she's our board secretary. I appreciate everyone for being here and thank you all so much. So that concludes this, um, uh, presentation. Again, it will be posted to our Facebook and YouTube pages where people can come and, and members can, you know, view uh, later on um, and just keep the dialogue going and continuing to learn. So thank you all so much. Everybody have a great rest thank of you. your day. Bye. Bye. Bye.